World War II is, at least in part, a conflict between democratic and authoritarian principles. But there are several pitfalls involved. First of all, the allies of the United Nations have a less than perfect record themselves in this area. None of them have achieved full democracy for all their citizens. Some are authoritarian regimes themselves, with one even outright totalitarian. Second of all, some of the freedoms and rights essential to a free, open, democratic society are not easily maintained under a situation of war. For the democratic countries of the Allies, both issues come together in the paradox between maintaining freedom of the press while keeping essential secrets about current events from the enemy. I'm Spartacus Olson. This is a World War II in real time special about censorship in the US and Great Britain during World War II. When we think of censorship, we often think of a practice that goes hand in hand with propaganda. The latter functions to spread one sided or outright false information about your own successes, your intentions, or those of your enemy, while the former has to prevent the truth from getting out. While this is mostly true for totalitarian regimes during World War II, where the governments often control the flow of information and forbid any narrative other than their own official version, it isn't really true for democratic countries during the war. They still have to navigate democratic laws and principles and consider both factual accuracy and freedoms of speech and the press. This is why the Western allies follow a strategy of truth at least on paper. But when war breaks out in September 1939, the British breathe live into the Ministry of Information responsible for issuing information to the public, propaganda, and censorship of the media. As the strategy of truth suggests, they aim not to manage the public with lies, misinformation, and limiting the flow of news or censoring the truth, but by public campaigns. And the press should only be censored when it puts the war effort at risk. So, the British put Defense Regulation Number 3 in place, prohibiting British citizens from publishing information which might be useful to an enemy. But only actual facts can be censored, not opinion. Forbidden topics include information about troop strength, army movements, war plans, and weather reports. Any such topics are slapped with a D notice for defense notice. The press must send articles with a D notice on them into the ministry. The article or report is then vetted and either allowed, redacted, or refused. While sending in the news to the ministry relies on voluntary participation, breaking the guidelines can have real consequences. This becomes clear in an orgy of censorship early in the war, when official reports and the news from Paris wrongfully claims that the British Expeditionary Force is engaged in combat with the Germans. The Ministry of Information and the War Office initially forbid the press from publishing anything about it, but because it's basically public information by then, the ban is lifted. However, the War Office wants to prevent any misinformation from becoming even more public, so they change their minds. To prevent the spread of fake news, Scotland Yard is called in to seize all newspapers and occupy all presses and offices if necessary, which they end up doing in some cases. We already covered this in more detail in the first episode of War Against Humanity. Link is in the description. In America, censorship also relies on voluntary participation from the press. Shortly after Pearl Harbor, Franklin Roosevelt's administration imposes censorship on American media and communications. On December 19, 1941, FDR signs Executive Order 8985, establishing the Office of Censorship. His accompanying statement reads, All Americans abhor censorship, just as they abhor war. But the experience of this and of all other nations has demonstrated that some degree of censorship is essential in wartime, and we are at war. It is necessary to the national security that military information which might be of aid to the enemy be scrupulously withheld at the source. It is necessary that a watch be set upon our border so that no such information may reach the enemy inadvertently or otherwise, through the medium of the mail, radio, or cable transmission, or by any other 
means. It is necessary that prohibitions against the domestic publication of some types of information contained in long existing statutes be rigidly enforced. The Office of Censorship is chaired by Byron Price, formerly an executive news editor at the Associated Press. As chief censor, Price shall cause to be censored in his absolute discretion communications by mail, cable, radio, or other means of transmission passing between the United States and any foreign country. He is aware of the implications, later reflecting that any approach to censorship in a democratic country is fraught with serious difficulties and grave risks. The word itself arouses instant resentment, distrust, and fear among free men. Everything the censor does is contrary to the fundamentals of liberty. He invades privacy ruthlessly, delays and mutilates the mails and cables, and lays restrictions on public expression in the press. All of this he can continue to do only so long as an always skeptical public is convinced that such extraordinary measures are essential to national survival. The censor's house is built on sand, no matter what statutes may be enacted or what the courts may declare. One of the policies mentioned in the executive order is the examination of all telegrams and postal mail crossing the U.S. border in either direction. By September 1942, roughly 10,000 censors in 18 locations will examine about 1 million postal items a week, gathering intelligence, depriving the enemy of receiving intelligence, and sanitizing or redacting parts of information not allowed to cross borders. Invasive as it may be, it can have a morale-boosting effect as well. The very act of writing and sending letters is now one of participation in the war effort. Everyone knows that someone from the government is reading their conversations, urging Americans to consider that avoiding the exchange of certain information could contribute to victory. This is in line with other public campaigns urging the practice of self-censorship, such as the Loose Lips Might Sink Ships campaign and Let's Censor Our Conversation About the War posters, emphasizing how careless communication could harm your fellow countrymen. Price's Office of Censorship's slogan is Silence Speeds Victory. Like the general public, the press also accepts and even requests censorship in favor of Team America. Media are asked to voluntarily self-censor, to refrain from publishing anything that might harm the American war effort. The majority of journalists agree with the need for such measures and abide by the code. In some cases, this makes mundane news reporting really weird, like when sports commentators can't mention how snowfall affected a game of baseball because they're not supposed to discuss the weather. Sure enough, a lot of mistakes are made. Some information is published because reporters aren't aware of their data's strategic nature. Still, by and large, the press refrains from reporting on factual information that might harm the war effort. But it isn't all sunshine and roses. Tensions between press and government flare up in Britain again when on 6th of March 1942, the Daily Mirror publishes a cartoon depicting a shipwrecked sailor with the caption, the price of petrol has been increased by one penny, below it. According to Philip Seck, the cartoonist, he meant to relativize a small inconvenience to the home front compared to a serviceman's sacrifice. But British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and Supply Minister Herbert Morrison see it as anti-British, suggesting the petrol companies are profiteering. Churchill calls on Zeck's background to be investigated. After debate in the House of Commons, the Mirror is given a severe reprimand amid fears that Morrison will shut the paper down, as he had already done with the Daily Worker. But who gets to decide which factual information is actually threatening to the war effort? Reporters suspect that security censorship is used as a pretext to get away with military incompetence or to keep people in the dark about strategic mistakes. Furthermore, what if reporting might expose the shady or hypocritical dealings of a government, or what if it might endanger the relations between allies? Well, the latter should be included in the censorship policy. At least that is what the British figure when in the spring of 1942 they modify Defense Regulation Number 3 from then on. Any word or passage which is likely to create disharmony among the Allied nations is scrapped as well. 
There are some instances when this vision clashes with the ideal of free speech and freedom, which were some of the supposed reasons for the Allied nations to engage in war with the Axis powers in the first place. Now, spoilers here. In the fall of 1942, the Allies will team up with French Admiral François Darlan in a military campaign in North Africa. Darlan was, up to that point, commander of the Vichy French Armed Forces, but reporters are forbidden from reporting on Darlan's recent anti-Semitic collaborationist and repressive policy. Dwight Eisenhower in Allied Command will ban any reporting on the general political situation in North Africa as well, reportedly because it might endanger the position of the Allied armies. In the eyes of the press, this is political censorship aimed at hiding Allied dealings with a questionable figure who was part of a regime that collaborated with the enemy. They say it is exactly those stories that should be covered by the press, functioning as the fourth estate, as a check on their government's conduct abroad, even in times of war. It won't be until 1945 that Eisenhower tells his censor that censorship is intended to be applied only as demanded by the requirements of military security. Now, wartime censorship in democratic countries was initiated by the governments and welcomed by the press to protect their war effort. After all, the press generally shared the view that they were fighting the good war against regimes in which something like freedom of speech or the press didn't even exist. Additionally, governments like to believe that restriction of the truth is more harmful than the truth itself. However, this strategy of truth ultimately proved to bear little substance. In some instances, the means to the end gain the upper hand over the truth. Looking towards the ultimate goal or with preserving a good relationship with an ally at any cost, censorship in some cases becomes ever more enforced, causing the relationship between press, military, and governments to remain strained throughout the war. Now, the repercussions to ideological disobedience in the press were much more severe in Nazi Germany, obviously. You can watch our Between Two Wars episode on the dismantling of democratic institutions in Nazi Germany right here. The democratic free flow of information is equally essential in our day and age. We ourselves are fully independent of any editorial control thanks to our Time Ghost army. Join this effort on timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Click the like button, leave a comment, and make sure to subscribe to the channel for more episodes like this one. See you next time.